Before we get to today's topic, I want to give a quick update on vaccines. As we announced on Tuesday, we opened up our next age band, 65 and over, for this Monday. But because Walgreens receives doses directly from the federal government, we gave them the okay to open 65 and over yesterday. As a reminder, the pharmacy vaccination program is run by the federal government, not by the states. So if you're 65 or older and you'd like to try to get an appointment with uh, Walgreens, you can visit their website. But again, everyone in this age band will be able to sign up for the state-run clinics uh, beginning on Monday morning. I believe it's at 8.15. Moving to our weekly education update. Today we'll go into detail on our education picture, in particular how our kids are doing and why it's so important to get them back into school. The unfortunate reality, as you've heard from us and pediatricians before, is that kids are not okay. And we're going to talk about some of the sobering details on that today. But I want to be very clear. I know our school administrators, teachers, staff, parents and kids across the state are working incredibly hard and facing challenges we've never faced before. The fact that our kids are struggling is not a reflection of the efforts of our schools, teachers, parents, or kids. The pandemic has put a tremendous strain on everyone, and I know they're doing their very best. Thankfully, because of all your efforts, we're much closer than many other states in getting our kids back to school five days a week so they can recover from the impacts of this pandemic. It was nearly a year ago when I made the very tough decision to close in-person learning at our schools. We all work quickly to set up remote systems and mitigate the impacts to our kids. Over the summer, schools developed remote and hybrid systems, and in September, we reopened, with most schools understandably choosing hybrid instruction. Today, about 30% of schools are in-person, about half are hybrid, and about 20% are still fully, prevent, uh, uh, fully remote after nearly a year. I appreciate the work of school employees and know that everyone is committed to doing what's best for our kids. As you'll hear today, the reality is we've got a lot of work to do. Because even with the improvements in remote learning and some in-person instruction available, it's not enough. As a result, our kids are not okay. And I know that's not acceptable to any of us. In fact, many kids are really struggling. Some seriously enough to end up in our emergency departments. Additionally, the increased demand on our mental health system is making it difficult to meet the need. We're also seeing many less severe, but still harmful and troubling developments, like kids reporting more anxiety, stress, sleeplessness, and substance misuse. Some kids have reported spending 12 to 14 hours every day online. Just think about that for a moment. Again, this is not a reflection of the hard work and commitment by our educators, but it is evidence that even with the very best remote learning experience, it doesn't compare to the value and benefits of in-person education. This is why in my inaugural address, I set a goal of getting all kids back uh, into uh, full person instruction before the end of the school year and hopefully by the end of April. And I want folks to understand, this goal isn't just about what I want. It's because the science and the data tells us our kids aren't doing well, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. The science and the data also tell us that we can put our, school, our kids back in school and still manage the effects of COVID-19. So the real goal here is, and I know it's one we all share, is to reverse the negative impact of the pandemic on our kids. As a former contractor myself, 
I like using building metaphors. And a few apply here, like when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And it's all about a good and solid foundation. Because a building, a system, a child is at risk now and in the future if it has a compromise or a weak foundation. Here's the bottom line. We have to start assessing the educational, social, and emotional impact the pandemic and remote learning has had on our kids. Then we have to work together to reverse those impacts as quickly as we possibly can. And that means, in this case, in-person instruction. This is the recovery work Secretary French has been talking about at these briefings and that he's been working on with his team at the Agency of Education, as well as the Department of Health, and through his regular meetings with superintendents, principals, and the teachers' union. And in a few minutes, he'll present the first phase of our recovery planning guidance. Before that, though, you'll hear from the Commissioner of Mental Health, Sarah Squirrel, and Holly Morehouse from Vermont After School about how kids are really feeling. If you're anything like me, you'll come away with a better understanding of why this is so important. But I want those involved in education to know. I understand the worries and the challenges that come along with it. I know there are logistical obstacles that make it harder than it may sound. And if we, but if we can agree on the goal, we can be creative and work through those details. We can clear the road, roadblocks. And we can achieve this goal while managing cases when they do occur. We have nearly a year of experience. And I'm confident that if educators share this goal, there is no barrier we can't overcome. We also know that the vaccine will help make this transition even easier. With our age banding strategy, We've already, we're already seeing the positive impacts in protecting those at risk of serious and severe illness and death. And we're also seeing case rates decline. But I understand that cases in schools, even when they're not transmitting uh, within the school itself, can be disruptive. And I recognize vaccines will help reduce that disruption and give more peace of mind. This is why I've said, with increased supply, I'm open to adjusting our strategy after we protect those at greatest risk of death. And as Secretary Smith has shared over the last several weeks, we're uh, continuing to have productive conversations with the Vermont NEA. When you consider we're now vaccinating those 65 and older, and we're moving more uh, quickly toward those with high risk conditions, we're clearly nearing our goal to protect those at most risk. And we'll get there, I believe, we'll get there a little ahead of schedule. Still, the challenge remains the supply. But I'm optimistic we're getting to a good place on that front as well. So you can expect some additions to our vaccine strategy sometime next week. While we also continue to move forward with those at greatest risk through age banding and health conditions. I hope this gives some comfort to school staff because we're truly in this together. And by pulling in the same direction, Vermont can again light the way uh, for the rest of the country. So uh, up next, we'll have uh, Commissioner Squirrel uh, talk about uh, what she's seeing. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly, as Vermonters, as the pandemic continues to wear on, uh, we all continue to feel the impacts of COVID, the impacts on our mental health, and we know that those impacts do extend to our children. We know that the impact of public health emergencies can have both short-term and long-term consequences to the mental health of children and youth. The pivot to hybrid and remote learning has left many of our Vermont children lacking the benefits of access to school, 
the social interaction, the personal connection, the sense of safety, the structure, and the routine. When we think about healthy development and buffering risk for children, we think about promoting protective factors, social connections, concrete supports, and building social and emotional competence. Access to school is one of the most powerful protective factors that we can provide to our children and youth. And every effort should be made to get our Vermont children and youth back to school. The costs of not getting them back are truly devastating, especially for the most vulnerable. We know that even before the pandemic, we were seeing concerning trends around the mental health of children across the state. The additional stress and strain of COVID has really revealed some of the fault lines that were already there. Even before COVID, one in three youth were reporting feeling sad or hopeless. Six out of 10 LGBTQ youth reported feeling sad or hopeless. We have seen rising rates in depression for youth and increased visits to pediatric emergencies across the state. And again, this was all before the compounding impacts of COVID and additional isolation. I'm going to walk us through what the current data is telling us. And one thing we have to keep in mind is that data is like a temperature gauge. It tells us we have a problem. It is up to us to take the action to fix it. A PACE study was done recently in collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health and UVM. It was a survey that compared data from the fall of 2020 to the fall of 2019. Youth aged 12 to 17 reported increases in depressive symptoms, increases in anxiety. Those increases in anxiety extended to young adults age 18 to 25. And around 70% of youth reported that the pandemic made their anxiety, worry, mood, loneliness a little or a lot worse. When we look at the data related to school-based mental health, children receiving school-based services, 59% of those youth who were surveyed using the CANS assessment, Child Adolescent Needs and Strengths, were identified as lacking community connection. 48% identified as lacking optimism. And in 2020, the rate of youth ED visits for mental health visits across the state increased. We also know that pediatricians across the state are reporting increased demand and increased mental health needs. A pediatric emergency physician noted, the adolescent aged children are struggling. There are increased number of emergency department visits for acute mental health needs. A primary care pediatrician noted, my practice has 11 mental health providers. In September, we had no wait list. Now we have 70 on the wait list. 75% to 80% of what I see every day is related to mental health in the last six to nine months. Another primary care pediatrician notes, the children are not okay. Every single day, the bulk of my time in pediatrics is spent managing mental health concerns of kids between the ages of 11 and 18. Our private providers across the state are also reporting long wait lists. We're seeing increase in absenteeism and truancy Community health providers reporting increased acuity, particularly in adolescents. And families are also under incredible stress. And we have to keep in mind when that caregivers have diminished capacity, it increases stress on children and decreases the buffering that we have to decrease risk. We also know that school is where we see our children and youth. It's a point of both access to services an assessment of need. Without the school key safeguards in place, they're less available to those children and youth who are most vulnerable. In calendar year 2020, 48% of children receiving Medicaid services, mental health services, receive those in a school setting. The number of students served through school-based mental health treatment and services in schools increased. And the Department for Children and Families has seen a 21% decrease in calls to their centralized intake and emergency services. The two most important factors in helping children cope with anxiety are communication and connection. 
and children are missing that connection right now, especially for adolescents who developmentally should be more oriented toward their peers right now. With less access to resources, less access to protective factors leads to increased vulnerability and risk. And decreased calls to child protection indicates that many children may be suffering in silence. We also have to acknowledge and recognize the stress on teachers, the need to care for the caregivers to support their well-being. Educators are critical to creating an environment where children can thrive, where they can build resilience and retain and regain some of those social connections that are so necessary. It also is so important that we hear from the youth. We hear what they are thinking and feeling. So I'm going to turn it over now to Holly Morehouse, the Executive Director from Vermont After School, who will share with you a little bit about the youth perspective. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Commissioner Squirrel. One of the many things that I love about Vermonters is how deeply and wholeheartedly we care about our children and youth. And what we have to focus on now, what we are hearing, that at this moment in time, as the Governor said, many are not okay. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about young adolescents and teenagers in particular. This pandemic has challenged us all. But the emotional impact on adolescents and teens is especially significant. Just at a time when everything they are, biologically, developmentally, and socially, is supposed to be about connecting with peers, figuring out who they want to be, building a sense of self-identity, and experiencing growing independence. Many are cut off, isolated, and lonely. The other thing that we need to consider is that a year to us adults is very different than a year to someone who is 12, 14, or 16. For a 16-year-old, it is 1 16th of their young life and a quarter of their entire high school experience. This is a year they will not get back, and it's a year that should be full of milestones, time hanging out with friends, developing new hobbies and interests, venturing out, and benefiting from all the connections and interactions, informal and formal, that come from being together with adult role models, teachers, youth workers, and peers. At this critical moment in time, young people need to feel safe and supported to re-engage in learning and recover from this period of loss and isolation. They need not only academic support, but also social and emotional support. They need help sustaining and rebuilding relationships, talking about their experiences and emotions, developing as leaders and agents of change, and re-engaging with their interests. They need time with friends, teachers, youth workers, mentors, opportunities for creative enrichment and expression, healthy meals, daily physical activity, and projects that allow them to explore and learn. Now more than ever, we need to listen to our young people. In times like these, youth voice and youth agents, agency are extremely important. At Vermont After School, I have the great privilege of working with youth serving organizations from all across the state. What I'd like to share here is recent data collected in October 2020 from which we can learn more from youth about how they are feeling and what they are experiencing. These data are just a small piece of what was collected, um, is being collected as part of a five-year initiative called the Vermont Youth Project. Through this project, Vermont After School is working with a number of Vermont communities to take a comprehensive look at how to strengthen protective factors for young people. We are utilizing a survey tool developed by the researchers from the Icelandic Center for Social Research and Analysis located at Reykjavik University. The Vermont Youth Project is uh, affiliated with a global initiative called Planet Youth. We are in the second year of this five-year effort in Vermont. All students in grades 7 through 12 in the participating communities were invited to take the survey. It was voluntary and had a 65% overall participation rate. Now, not all the data is bad. Youth report spending more time with their families, and in some cases, substance misuse is down due to increased supervision. However, I'd like to draw your attention to the data points on the screen. Youth reported that in the past month, 38% of them 
uh, report that they sometimes or often felt that difficulties were piling up so high and so much that they could not overcome them. Over 45% of high schoolers say that COVID has made their mental health worse. And when you dig further into the data, they are concerned not only about their own mental health, but about the mental health of those around them. 47% of high, schools, high schoolers reported that COVID has worsened school connections. And 57% of the 11th and 12th graders who responded say that it hurt their educational experience. Over 50% of the 11th and 12th graders say that they are lonelier due to COVID and 48% feel more anxious. 41% of youth had nervousness in the last week and 35%, over one third of our young people had sleeping problems. One other note I'd like to make on the data, when we did the survey um, in 2019, we had an 82% response rate. This year we had a 65% response rate and I just want to note also that difference and be able to connect with and reach out and hear from young people has also been challenging. When I read these data points I hear youth speaking out strongly and telling us once again that all is not okay. That we need to focus on our youth right now and find a way to do more. I appreciate our state's efforts and all that is being done to get all of Vermont students back in school in person to expand access to after school programming and to offer engaging and enriching summer programs this year. I hope we can come together and do everything we can to create a spring and summer for our young people that is about connection, healing, youth voice, learning, and growth. Thank you for your time this morning. And at this point, I will turn over the podium to uh, Secretary Dan French, who is going to speak about the Education Recovery Plan framework. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Holly, and thank you for the work of your organization. Uh, before I get into the recovery planning, I just thought I'd give a couple of quick updates on related education issues. Um, <clears throat> firstly, on surveillance testing in our schools, we had about half of our schools were on vacation this week, so we didn't run the testing. Uh, the testing will resume next week. In collaboration with the Agency of Human Services, uh, we published a survey this week for school staff and child care providers uh, to understand their interest in getting vaccinated. Uh, to date, our vaccination strategy has largely been de determined by the very limited supply of vaccine. Um, as we said along, as the governor mentioned, as those supplies increase and they continue to increase steadily now, um, particularly with the prospect of having the Johnson & Johnson vaccine available, um, our strategy uh, will evolve, and essentially that's what's happened this week. Uh, our planning has been ramped up as a result of potential new supplies coming into the state. We're not settled yet uh, on what the next phase of the strategy will be, uh, but we want to obtain a sense and interest among school staff and child care uh, providers to inform our planning. Uh, greatly appreciate their flexibility and quick response to that. Uh, it was a quick turnaround and survey still open through Monday. Um, but it's going to provide critical information for us to inform the next steps in our vaccination planning. As I mentioned on Tuesday, uh, we received word from the U.S. Department of Education last Friday on the status of a waiver request over SBAC testing this spring. Uh, I thought I'd provide a quick update on that. Uh, firstly, the U.S. Department of Education will be inviting states to submit waivers on the testing, but the waiver invitation will not include the ability to request a waiver for holding the test itself. We will be required to administer the SBAC. We will be provided a waiver opportunity for some of the testing provisions. Uh, these areas include possibly reducing the length of the tests, using online testing, and possibly extending the testing window into the summer and the fall. Also, we may submit a waiver to not have the test count as part of our accountability system. The next step in this process is the U.S. Department of Education will issue a waiver template form. Uh, once we receive the form, we'll make a decision as to which of the waiver options make sense for Vermont. Uh, the waiver process will include a mandatory public comment period, so we will be soliciting public input on our decision. Meanwhile, uh, we're working with our testing vendor to understand our options for modifying SBAC administration uh, relative to what could be available under the waiver. Um, not every state uses the SBAC, so it's important that we understand uh, what, what the impact of the waiver might be on the SBAC itself, and our decisions will be de determined to a certain extent around uh, the specifics of the SBAC. 
And now to turn to the recovery, uh, this afternoon we will be publishing our first guidance document uh, for what we're terming the recovery phase in education. This will be the first in a series of guidance documents that will guide our recovery work in the coming weeks and months. We do find ourselves in a fairly unique position uh, as a state relative to the pandemic. Um, through the hard work and sacrifice of all Vermonters uh, last spring and summer, we were able to suppress uh, the spread of the virus to a very high degree. This allowed us to successfully reopen our schools in September, and most of our schools have remained open uh, throughout the pandemic due to the hard work of school staff, state employees, and the cooperation of the students and their families. At the same time, however, we know the current disposition of our school system does not begin to approach its pre-COVID-19 effectiveness. Students that were at risk of falling behind or had developmental challenges prior to the pandemic are no doubt more at risk now. Some students who normally perform, perform very well in school are not doing so well right now in the remote environment. And the pandemic has been the cause of heightened anxiety and depression among many students. With the advent of vaccines and return to warmer weather, we can anticipate the conditions in our communities will start to improve significantly. This provides an opportunity to position our education system to address the impact of this pandemic more directly. We are calling this next phase recovery, which is a term better known in emergency management. Although this public health emergency is not over, we need to act now to prevent an educational emergency from occurring. Our forthcoming guidance will outline a structure and process for us to organize our recovery work. The recovery work will be a partnership between districts and their state support teams, which will be organized and led by the Agency of Education. The recovery work will be broken down into phases, with the first phase being the assessment of school district conditions in three focus areas, and then the process will shift to planning and then to implementation. All of these phases, including the assessment phase, require more in-person contact with students. So while the recovery planning process unfolds, we'll be encouraging districts to implement more person instruction, more in-person. 30% of our schools are currently operating with full in-person. This includes 50% of our elementary schools. The point I make is that we know how to do this right now in these current conditions. So as the conditions improve with the virus in the coming weeks, we wanna see more schools operating at full in-person to enact the shift in this recovery phase. As we build momentum towards full in-person this spring, our goal will be to have districts to have their recovery priorities identified and plans established prior to June 1st. This timeline is coincidental with the planning processes districts have for federal grants and acknowledges that the recovery process will continue into the next school year. We want districts to be able to focus their grants and spending strategies on the recovery work and to think about how they might leverage summer activities in particular to meet the needs of students in the three focus areas. I suspect that many districts will utilize summer programming to address non-academic priorities, such as student engagement and social emotional supports. At the state level, our support teams will assist districts with gathering the necessary data to inform their planning priorities. Another key function of the state support teams will to, do, to coordinate with services with other state agencies, such as DCF and mental health. I do want to acknowledge that this recovery planning work will take place in a context where school staff are extremely fatigued and under considerable stress themselves. Nevertheless, we must find the energy and inspiration to get our kids back full time and begin the end of the pandemic. It is our hope that by working together through a focused recovery process, we will demonstrate that the Vermont education system has managed both the safety and the educational needs of our students better than any education system in the world. In the early phases of this pandemic, we benefited greatly from difficult experiences of other countries such as Italy at a time when no one understood the impact of the virus on society. Now it's our turn to share our expertise and the hard lessons we've learned. Vermont, with its model management of the crisis to date, has a responsibility to be one of the first states to articulate an education recovery plan and to lead in the practical work of helping our students recover from this pandemic. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over back to the governor. Thank you, Secretary French. Um, we'll now open it up to questions. Uh, as a reminder, uh, while not here in person, Commissioner Levine and Secretary Smith are on the phone and 
ready, willing, and able to answer any questions you might have. Um, thanks, Governor. So, you know, you, you mentioned that we're making additions to our vaccine strategy that could potentially bring some uh, comfort to educators. Um, so I guess our, at this point, you know, do you plan on school staff getting their own vaccine prioritization? Well, again, we're not ready to make that decision at this point. We're gathering information. Uh, the supply has a lot to do with it, um, but we're comforted by the fact that we've seen an increase in supply almost every week. The Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine coming online uh, this weekend is going to uh, enter into the equation as well. And we're awaiting the, the results of the survey that we put out uh, to educators and staff uh, amongst the educational community to see what the uptake is, what, what the demand will be. So there's still a lot of factors to work our way through, but we're meeting, uh, trying to figure out what it is uh, that we can do to get our kids back in school and relieve any apprehension they might have in doing so. But first, we want to make sure, again, uh, we protect the most vulnerable, those 65 and over. We're going to be starting those. Uh, well, we started those in uh, Walgreens uh, today. Uh, but, uh, but on Monday, we'll start signing them up and then go to the chronic conditions, underlying health conditions so that we need to get through as well. So again, we're not, we want to continue down with our approach that we've been taking, uh, taking, uh, but, um, but as well with the increased supply, we might be able to do another uh, system. So we'll, we're contemplating that as we speak. What, uh, in the survey with educators, what, what threshold would you need to see? Um, you know, 50%, 70%, 80%? Again, we'll see what the uptake is and what the survey comes back with. Um, we're just, I'm just hearing a lot of different, uh, um, I guess, statistics uh, throughout the country. It depends on where you are. I'm hopeful uh, that this, there'll be a high uh, uptake here in, in Vermont, but in other parts of the country, it's, it's rather low. So again, we'll just see what, what the desire is, what the demand is, and then we'll go from there. A separate note as well, um, Congressman Welch um, says that um, potentially if Congress passes this new uh, $1.9 trillion stimulus package, Vermont could see upwards of $900 um, million, about 300 to towns and 600 to uh, state government. How do you envision some of those funds being spent and sort of the priority as we recover? Yeah, it, it's difficult to say at this point. Uh, we need to see the final version. A lot can change, uh, as we know. It can change in our own legislature. It can change in Congress, even if it passes uh, uh, the way we see it today in the, in the House. It still has to go through the Senate. Uh, there's a couple things that uh, I'd like to see worked out, and I'm, I have a little bit of concern over one being uh, at the... Uh, uh, disperse, uh, disbursement of funds uh, may be connected to your uh, UI, uh, for instance, and we have a fairly low unemployment rate in Vermont. So that wouldn't be good for Vermont and many states that have done the right thing and trying to, to keep their economy going and investing in those areas. So we'll just have to wait and see um, what the final version is, uh, but we'll, we'll work together and uh, make sure that we're we put it into place to help those in need as well as uh, help our businesses uh, recover and uh, get to a position where we're really uh, much better off than we were maybe before we headed in. On that same note, on, on the state side of things, I believe uh, the House is passing today. Or the, uh, there our response to uh, the COVID uh, recovery. Um, it looks like it's uh, going to have an easy time of it over here in the House, getting over to the Senate. Uh, any comments on that? Anything you'd like to see, or have they done a sufficient job for you? Yeah, again, uh, in large part, they took a lot of the things that we had uh, put forth in our budget, so I'm encouraged by that. Um, I'm a little concerned about the pension aspect um, and what that means uh, for, for some. Again, we have a huge uh, pension um, liability issue in the state, uh, both in uh, retirement and uh, to the pension fund and so forth. Uh, and we need to, uh, to work those details out. Uh, and I know that they put aside $20 million to do that, uh, but we have a $5.7 billion problem on our hands. Uh, and this is going to have to be solved uh, by, I believe, led by the legislature and the treasurer and I'm a willing participant, but they have to lead in this area. Uh, I've been talking about this for quite some time, as has others. 
uh, but this is clearly uh, an area that they're going to have to take the lead on. So I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. $20 million is not going to fix the problem. And uh, they're going to have to, to again, uh, take, the, take this opportunity to, to fix it and uh, to try and get to the, to the, uh, to the root of the problem. And uh, again, I'm a willing participant, but, uh, uh, but I'm a little concerned that we're kicking the can down the road a bit. And we just have to, again, work together in order to, to take, take on this uh, incredibly difficult, challenging problem. But it's something that uh, we can't uh, continue down this path at, at the present rate. It is the um, proverbial uh, elephant in the, uh, in the room. Um, and, and really within the next year or two years, we're going to have to have some sort of uh, uh, step towards that. Uh, do you have any, uh, I mean, going to have to raise revenue somehow to, uh, to do this, don't you think? Well, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, ways to, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. But again, it's going to take leadership in the legislature by the um, majority party, uh, as well as the, the treasurer. Um, and we'll have to have uh, some input as well, um, as well as uh, the, the unions uh, that are involved, whether it's the uh, state employees or the teachers union, they have to be at the table too. Um, because again, we can't force this, we're just going to have to work together and uh, be realistic uh, about what we can do and what we can't do. But I, I know uh, this is going to have an effect on our bonding ability in the future. Uh, I, I, this has increased from 4.3 billion to 5.7 billion in a matter of a couple of years. So uh, this is uh, truly, truly uh, an area of great concern for me and many others. And um, we just have to, uh, to come to real, the realization uh, that, uh, that we have to solve it. Thank you. Stuart, NBC5. Thanks, uh, good morning. Given all that you've just said about kids suffering and teachers being the key to fixing that with more in-person, uh, why struggle with the decision to prioritize teacher immunization? Well, again, uh, Stuart, as we've said, we had a, a path forward where we wanted to make sure we took care of the most vulnerable. I, again, 90% of the deaths in Vermont have been six, uh, the age groups 65 and over. And we know those who have underlying certain health, underlying health conditions uh, are impacted as well. So we need to take care of the most vulnerable first. Uh, and then I've said we're, we're willing to have conversations about where we go next. Um, but we want to make sure, uh, again, that uh, everyone is willing, if that will reduce the apprehension, uh, that if we can move forward uh, in the vaccination process in this sector, uh, that they will indeed, everyone will uh, come to the table and, and find a way to get our kids back into the classroom. So it, it just, there's a lot of moving pieces and, and uh, we just need to uh, consider all of that uh, before we make any decisions. But, but again, the, the Johnson Johnson is key uh, in order to get more supply as well as the commitment from the Biden administration to continue to uh, increase our supply as we move forward. So. It all works together, and um, and again, uh, Secretary French has been meeting uh, with educators and and other interested parties <clears throat> um, throughout the last uh, number of weeks. So, hopefully, we're in a good position where we can move forward. We'll hear more about it next week, uh, but the but the time isn't today because we're still waiting to hear some details from the federal government. Sure. Uh Secretary French indicated that the survey results were, I guess, due back on Monday. But can you share uh, what the uh, survey of public school employees, can you share what they're telling you so far? Secretary French. Hi, Stuart. Um, no, I don't, I don't have analysis of the results. I would just comment that, um, you know, we, we stood up the survey very quickly. Once again, the the supply information is uh, is improving in its quality, and it's been a pretty rapid turnaround. Um, we deployed the survey Wednesday afternoon very quickly. Uh, within the first hour, we had about a thousand uh, responses on the school survey, and by the end of that day, we had over well, just about 6,800. This morning, we have over 10,000 responses. Uh, but the key piece uh, is we have um, half the schools on vacation this week, so. Uh, we're going to see a big response on Monday, so I can't really speak to any of the trends we're seeing from the data that we have so far. I'm pleased with the response. 
uh, but we'll see a big response on Monday as well. Mr. Secretary, would there be any uh, extension of the school year uh, in, in light of the disruptions? Well, as I sort of outlined in the, um, in the recovery plan, our first step is to understand what exactly are the conditions on a district, a district basis. There's a lot of speculation about what the possible solutions would be. And I mentioned summer. I think that's an obvious one. Uh, but I think really, if we can carve out a couple of weeks to really do that assessment, we're going to be in a really good position to uh, create strategies that will actually work. And I think the other piece is that we have, uh, as you know, Holly indicated, we have an opportunity in Vermont really to partner with a lot of different uh, support groups and uh, people providing services, summer camps and so forth. So there's a lot we can bring to the table, but it does require us to do sort of an initial assessment to really understand what, what's before us in terms of the recovery work. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Good morning. Local wedding and event venues report that their clients who have June events are now at a proceed or cancel point. They need guidance. They're trying to retain business for the balance of summer and fall. And collectively, they report already having lost half of their 2021 event business. Given that Massachusetts has recently issued wedding and event guidance that is effective March 23rd, when can Vermont wedding and event venue operators expect some tangible guidance? Yeah, um, I understand uh, the complexity and, and the challenge they're facing. Uh, right now, today, as you have noted or have seen, um, our focus is on trying to get our kids back in the classroom. We think that that's the most pressing need we have in trying to get uh, as many vaccinated as possible. Um, I would say uh, sometime, uh, first part of April, we be, will be able to, if everything goes right, uh, be able to lay out the, the time frame and a strategy that we're using that we've already developed. Um, but there are many pieces of the puzzle that have to come together first, and we're not, uh, I'm not willing uh, to, uh, to move forward on that until I'm assured that uh, other things have fallen into place. So uh, again, we're working on it, and I understand, uh, and, and I certainly uh, have a lot of appreciation for what they're going through as a former business owner myself. Uh, and uh, and they see this uh, this challenge ahead of them, but, uh, but we're just not there yet. And uh, every state has a different strategy. I'm sure you can go uh, to Massachusetts and find uh, that they um, that we have done a lot of things and moved forward in a lot of areas that they have not. So everyone's using a different strategy. And for us right now, we just can't um, we can't commit to to moving forward and giving them what they want uh, right now. But uh, but it should be in the very near future. Thank you. And then I have a question that is most likely for um, Secretary Smith. Uh, when do you anticipate that people with chronic health conditions will be able to make appointments to get vaccinated? Thank you for that question, Lisa. I would uh, stay tuned on Tuesday. And just one quick follow-up. If Vermont does prioritize educators and front-facing school staff, how many people does that represent? Um, we're looking at um, approximately with childcare just over uh, 30,000. Great. Thank you very much. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, the state has said it's, it's partner, partnering with uh, Walgreens and other businesses to provide vaccine shots. Um, I'm wondering how much the state of Vermont is receiving from each of these for-profit businesses and will the money be earmarked for COVID-related expenses or promotion or COVID-related items? We, we've heard mixed reviews, by the way, from people that have been unable to sign in to Walgreens uh, in the islands in Chittenden County, Washington County, Caledonia County, and... Uh, I'm just wondering what you've heard as yeah. far as yeah. that and, and the money that the state's getting from these for-profit businesses. Uh, again, 
Uh, these contracts are between the federal government and the pharmacies, not we don't have contracts with them ourselves. But I'll let uh, Secretary Smith uh, make sure that I'm correct on that. But, but again, that's been some of the, the challenge, but also uh, we've been able to utilize them in certain ways as well. So um, they're getting, receiving their doses directly from the federal government. Secretary Smith. Yeah, that's right, Governor. Um, that's a contract between the federal government and uh, the pharmacy, and they will um, they will get their doses directly. I do um, I do want to say we knew that Walgreens had an allotment that was coming in on uh, Wednesday or uh, Wednesday, and we gave them the permission to go ahead and use that earlier on 65. Now, that was an allotment that was unanticipated, but we knew the supply was limited. I think it was about 4,300 uh, doses. So right now, Walgreens is full, um, and we pretty much knew that was going to happen given the size of the group. But if people will call on Monday or use our or sign up for our program, that 65 plus on Monday that opens up on March 1st, we have slots for everyone that is in that those age groups. And again, you know the um, the thing that I would recommend is go on go on our uh, website at healthvermont.gov/myvaccine and start an account and sign up at 8:15 on Monday for an appointment. We have ample appointments. We have slots for everyone. And uh, I would urge everyone to go to, to that. But for this one sort of situation where they had uh, 4,300 doses that were available, um, we allowed them to open up early on the 65, re recognizing it was going to fill pretty fast. Well, we, we did hear from one caller who uh, uh, did get through uh, or online, and, but was, I guess, online but was insulted that they had to agree to accept uh, promotional emails from Walgreens for their flyers in order to advance off the page. And that's why obviously they're making a ton of money off this. And uh, I guess I get your answer that state of Vermont is not getting any of this money. It's all going to the federal government. But, uh, well, it's it's going, it, Mike, it's going the other way around. The federal government is going to Walgreens for the money. Okay. Yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry. Uh, my follow-up to Stuart's question about the teachers, uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are two great groups that few, if any, object to, and, and those are the grocery store workers and the teachers. And uh, I think the news story this week about the other groups wanting to cut the line didn't really, uh, there didn't seem to be any groups that were really bubbling to the top and probably in the eyes of the public. I mean, it's sort of like the police. Everybody agreed they ought to be near the top. So I guess I got to ask again. So what's wrong with grocery store workers and cashiers, teachers? I mean, I think everybody seems to be pretty strongly in agreement that they ought to be the next group. And I'm just amazed that there isn't a an announcement that they're next. Stay tuned. Uh, Mike, I mean, we're, we're contemplating this. Again, our data, the data and the science tells us who's really impacted. And when you look at uh, um, um, some of those in those age groups, they're the most impacted. So they have to come first. When you have a limited supply, you have to make decisions, you have to prioritize, and that's what we've done and done so successfully. And I think in the end, uh, the, uh, people will see the merits uh, to what we're doing. Uh, we're not seeing uh, a great deal of impact uh, for those who are in person at this point in time uh, throughout uh, throughout Vermont. We're not seeing a huge number of uh, of uh, of those impacted by the virus. That's just that's just the fact. That's part of our data and the science that tells us that. But it's important to us uh, to move forward in this system, in the education system, as because of what we laid out today. So we may uh, want to move forward if it re removes some of the apprehension, if it reduces uh, that apprehension uh, and gets our kids back into school 
then we may have to do that. But we're going to have to go a little bit further in order to understand that. But again, um, you know, the older you are, regardless of the age band, the older you are, uh, or with certain health conditions, the more impacted you are by the virus. That's just the fact. Uh, I might ask Commissioner Levine if he has anything to add to that. Uh, thank you, Governor. The only thing I would add to your very apt description is the fact that there are states that have chosen to try to do it all at once, to try to get the very old, the, the most ill, and all of the sectors that my colleague was talking about uh, vaccinated concurrently. And that strategy for most of them has only led to disappointment amongst all of those groups because they're all competing with one another for what has been until now a very scarce resource. Our choice of the preserved life strategy is really critical because we want those people done very, very quickly. We want to get them all in the first wave of vaccination without the feeling that they're competing with a bunch of other groups who will still benefit from vaccine, no question, but they probably won't die from COVID or be hospitalized from COVID. And that's really what our data has shown us, and that's why we approach it in this manner. Thank you. Mike, no, I, I understand age is important. Thank you. Mike, yeah. I, I would just add uh, as well, if we all of a sudden, and I, and I, I want to be clear about this, if we do uh, move and and vaccinate the education system, um, we'll do it concurrently with the plan that we have in place right now. We are not going to put uh, the education system in front of those with underlying conditions, for instance. Uh, we'll continue to try and do to have parallel paths and, and do it simultaneously to that. But I would guarantee if all, all of a sudden tomorrow we decided to vaccinate uh, the whole education system and, and put them ahead of someone else, you'd have a, one or two of your readers uh, probably reach out and say, well, why not me? I thought I was next. Why, why are they coming before me? I'm more impacted, uh, and I'm, I'm, I may be uh, at risk of being hospitalized or death, and, and the data shows that they're not. Why, why, why are they doing that? So I would say this controversy will continue uh, throughout the entire vaccination process until we get to the end. But we're doing the best we can using the data and the science to, to uh, influence our decisions. And thus far, I think we're doing it right. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Aaron, VT Digger. Hey, um, is reporting an outbreak of at least 21 inmates at a Northern State Correctional Facility. I was wondering if there had been any updated numbers um, since the last time that was published um, and what the state is doing to kind of respond to that surge in cases there. Yeah, Secretary Smith. Yes, Aaron, we are just, we're gonna be sending out a uh, press release um, as soon as I can get off this call and approve it. Uh, this afternoon, it talks about uh, the Newport facility is in full lockdown because there are 22 positive cases. Um, there are one. There is one staff member in the Newport facility that has tested positive, and 21 incarcerated individuals that have tested uh, positive in that facility. Just to let you know, system wide, we have six staff members that are positive and uh, 30. Uh, inmates that are positive system-wide uh, right now. Those are still uh, statistics that um, are better than the, um, the statewide average here in Vermont, but nonetheless, they are troubling, and we are trying to figure out the best way that we can to meet this challenge is figure out how we stop the virus from entering the facilities. And that's gonna be key here because where we have found that these facilities are susceptible to the virus coming in and uh, we've had great success, as you know, we've had great success in these uh, facilities throughout the pandemic. We have to find a way to make sure 
that we can um, that we can stop the virus from coming into the facility, and we're looking at that right now. We're also looking at how we can um, enhance our quarantine process in order to make sure that we can protect um, uh, those that are those that are in those facilities moving forward. Okay. Um, any any in insight so far on what could be kind of causing this particular latest? Um, outbreak? I, I suspect, no, uh, we're doing contact tracing right now, but I suspect it's like the other issues that we've had. It's come from outside the facility, usually, um, you know, a person or two that are bringing it into the facility from the outside. We're just going to have to wait till the contact tracing tells us what, what, what happened in this case. I mean, it focuses on kind of preventing the virus from coming into the facility. Is there anything that you can do to kind of limit its spread once it gets into a facility? I mean, more social distancing, more protection for the inmates and staff? Well, we do that, uh, frankly. We, everybody is masked. Um, there is, you know, an attempt to uh, make social distancing as much as possible. Uh, you, you know, in, in many respects, um, these facilities have, and they're locked down when there is a um, when there is a situation within the facility. We've been quite lucky for some time here, but at the same time, when we do have something like this, we do have to lock down the facility. We do have to make sure we do an evaluation of that. We do contact tracing to make sure the spread is limited. The other thing that we do that is probably unique to Vermont, we do a lot of testing of our facilities. And when we do have an outbreak, that testing is multiple, multiple times within a, a week or so period. So, um, you know, we're, we're working on that as, as we move forward right now. This facility will be tested multiple, multiple times to make sure that we can isolate and make sure this doesn't spread. Okay, thanks. I also have a question for, I, I believe, Dr. Levine. Um, are you concerned about the news of a variant that is potentially less, um, you know, F, the, the vaccine is potentially less effective against appearing in New York a couple of days ago? <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it gives me a chance to uh, announce that we did get some results back from the specimens we sent earlier in the week for genome sequencing. Uh, they had been delayed because of uh, all of the weather events. Um, and uh, those samples that were predominantly from Burlington and from Bennington County um, were all negative for any of the uh, variant strains. Obviously, we continue to be monitoring this very, very closely. The Burlington wastewater uh, assessment that was just performed this past week uh, did continue to indicate the presence of uh, mutant um, sequences that were tested that might indicate the various strains present. So we continue to send uh, Burlington specimens on a weekly basis to see if any of them will show this in the sequencing. But thus far, Vermont is really one of only a few states that has not yet found a variant strain in the PCR testing that we do. Having said that, uh, all of the variant strains concern me, not just the, the new ones that are being seen in New York City, and there are also new ones being seen in California. Um, it just tells us that the virus is doing what it's doing because it's had an opportunity to replicate multiple, multiple times and be transmitted from person to person very effectively at a time when the country was in what's now being called, I guess, the third surge. Um, so the good news is the vaccine that's being debated about today and will probably get emergency use authorization uh, seems to be effective against all of the industries, including in South Africa. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna have performed relatively well against most of the strains, but less well against the South Africa. And we just don't know much about the ones in New York City yet because literally they've just been announced within this week. So it's going to be a little hard to tell how that goes. But I do think that if this could be an opportunity for me to say this, 
Um, the country has been in a marked downswing in cases and hospitalizations that has just recently leveled off and in some places is starting to go back up, though at a very gentle rate. But that's of concern to me more than new strains being found in new places because I really think the month of March is going to be a critical month for us all. We're going to have increasing amounts of people with both natural immunity and vaccine-mediated immunity, which is going to be a wonderful thing. Uh, and we hopefully will still have the impact of positive behavior change that occurred after the holidays have passed. Um, but March is a month where uh, we're already seeing some states in the country saying, we've won this battle, we can ease off on some of our restrictions. There have been talks in some states of uh, eliminating their mask mandates. Most um, people in the uh, infectious disease and epidemiology communities do not believe for one minute that we can ease up on all of the things we do every day, specifically with masking and with distancing during the month of March. It's going to be the month that really counts. So we shouldn't just relax because more people are getting vaccinated. We should realize that if we don't want to see more of these strains like the ones appearing in New York City, we need to be very focused on trying to not let our guard down and continuing on the behavior patterns that we've been trying to practice faithfully all along just a little while longer because this is a chance to really uh, allow more suppression of the virus and more of us get vaccinated and less chance for mutations to occur. Okay, thank you. Devin, Local 22? Um, yeah, Dr. Levine, my question was actually about um, rumors that other states like Texas are considering lifting their mask mandate, and you talked about how important the month of March is. Um, on the flip side, how important, once the weather starts getting warmer, are you know sort of innovative outdoor ideas going to be? I know there were a lot of those that were sort of put in place on the fly last summer. Um, what are you sort of interested to see now that businesses and towns have had a little bit more time to consider what this summer might look like, some of the sort of innovation that can happen with outdoor stuff this year. Yeah, thanks for asking that, because uh, I didn't want my previous answer to be a gloom and doom answer by any means. Um, it's just a stay, uh, very uh, committed statement about the month of March. But, you know, even... Uh, here in Vermont, in the middle of winter, you know, we've been able to really do a lot. And we've been able to let our population uh, be more active in the outdoors environment uh, and feeling less restricted during those times uh, as compared with, you know, group gatherings and the indoor stuff. So uh, we've been able to demonstrate that people can get outside and uh, still respecting the basic rules do a lot more than they might have imagined. It's certainly far away from where we were a year ago in March. Um, with regard to even beyond March, but this year, just the spring and summer, um, there is a belief that some of that seasonality will have an impact due to temperature and humidity considerations on the amount of virus that's active. But do remember we did have a second wave in the country uh, during the summer last year. There's also, I think, as more people are vaccinated, great opportunities for us to do more in the outdoors environment that won't require as much rigidity with regard to the practices that we uh, practice now. Uh, that won't mean you can go to a movie indoors and not uh, wear a mask. Uh, but certainly if you're uh, at a beach in the summertime, I do think there'll be opportunities for us to be really uh, much more relaxed in that sense. I don't want to get ahead of things and talk about things that would involve group gatherings, because again, um, that's what the virus and any virus thrives on, is people in large groups are in very close proximity, not wearing masks. We'll have to see where we are as these months evolve. But clearly, um, the first thing we did in the pandemic management was, of course, reduce the size of gatherings. 
So what one would expect, but that's not going to be the first thing that gets relaxed um, as time goes on. And even in states that are uh, allowing some of their stadiums to function again, we're talking about 10 or 12 percent capacity right now, which is uh, very minimal, obviously. But I think you should look forward to the opportunities for more of those kinds of things to occur. And uh, some of them, even in a mask-free way, outdoors as the summer wears on, um, assuming that a lot of the success we've seen in vaccination continues and the success we've seen in holding the virus numbers down continues as well. Right, thank you. All right, we're going to check back with Lisa at the AP. Lisa, AP? All right, we will go to Pat at WCAX. Hi. This one is for Commissioner Squirrel. It's about adult mental health. I did an interview earlier this week with some folks from Washington County Mental Health Services who told me their call volume has doubled and there's a 100 person wait list for individual therapy that translates to about an eight to 10 week wait. Um, of course, they can reach people who are in direct crisis sooner with different programs, but an eight to 10 week if you want, uh, wait if you wanted individual therapy. I imagine they're not the only agency in the state that's seeing this kind of demand for adult um, increase during the pandemic. Is there anything the state and mental health department could be doing to help ease the burden on some of these local agencies? Yeah, thanks for the question, Kat. Certainly as we've focused our attention on children and youth today, we know that adults are also in need of mental health services, um, which is why as we've looked at resources coming into the state, uh, federal funding and grants, uh, the Department of Mental Health has been in receipt of SAMHSA uh, COVID relief dollars, um, as well as additional federal grants that we have all targeted towards our community mental health agencies so that they can continue to expand and be responsive to the needs of Vermonters across the state. Uh, we also have stood up COVID Supports Vermont, uh, which I spoke about uh, many weeks ago in terms of access. Um, Vermonters can simply call 211. Uh, we have embedded clinicians that are ready and available to take your call. Um, and then continuing to look across um, other grants and opportunities that are coming into the state um, so that we can continue to expand access, um, as well as ensuring and working with our private practitioners across the state as well. And they told me a lot of, of course, the demand they're seeing is due to how long the pandemic has been going on for. How long do you expect it will take adults, and then you know, if you want to address it, given today's themes, separately kids and teens, to recover from the mental health impact of this pandemic? Yeah, that's another great, great question, Kat. And certainly we anticipate um, that there will be a lag in terms of ongoing impacts of uh, COVID-19 pandemic on our mental health. Um, the good news for children is that children and youth um, are very resilient. Um, and if we can double down on our commitment to get them back to public school where they can access uh, resources and supports uh, for most children, um, they will be able uh, to recover, um, to regain that social connection, to rebuild that resiliency um, in the context of school where they access many of their most nourishing and safe relationships. And for adults as well, um, you know, as we, you know, the outlook has become more optimistic, um, there is hope. Uh, we would also anticipate that as we move forward, um, adults will certainly um, start to feel some of the weight of the pandemic lift. And I think where we will continue to need to focus energy and attention is on those individuals who prior to COVID were experiencing more serious and persistent mental health challenges, really ensure that they have the targeted resources that they need, the outreach, the case management, um, that's all essential to their ongoing recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Um, good afternoon. I have gotten another message from a reader whose um, questions I've forwarded to, I guess, Dr. Levine before. Um, she is still very concerned about her inability to see her mother 
Um, her mother's been vaccinated. She's been vaccinated. Uh, her vaccination was long enough ago to have taken full effect. And obviously, since she is uh, qualified to be vaccinated, her mother is older. Um, her question is that uh, the nursing home where her mother is, is still not allowing her to have a contact visit with her mother. And she wants to know if the state is uh, providing more guidance to long-term care facilities um, that will encourage people to be willing to um, open up a little more quickly. Secretary Smith. Yes, Joe, thanks for the question. Uh, about a week ago, I announced that we were revising our guidance for, in particular, to the question that you're asking, visitation, uh, especially with, um, with residents that, that have been vaccinated. Um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis with the facility, but at the same time, we have met with all the facilities, the long-term care facilities, uh, this week uh, with, in regard to this guidance, and we'll be issuing uh, this guidance effective uh, today, I think it is. Um, it will be on our website with that, uh, with that guidance for the individual. But the way that you've described it to me, um, under our guidance, that person would be allowed to visit um, their relative. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I have a question for Mike Smith and Dr. Levine. Uh, Mike, uh, regardless of what uh, the next phase looks like with conditions and whether uh, school staff is included, you are going to have to parse that group because of the, the size of it, right? For instance, when the advisory panel uh, offered its uh, report, it suggested that Down syndrome and sickle cell anemia and pregnancy would be should be in that group regardless of age uh, in the next uh, chronic conditions group. Um, there will be a parsing in some way of this group, is that correct? Yeah, th that's correct. There'll be, there's gonna be a list, and actually it's, it's listed on the um, health department website right now of what we consider um, high risk conditions that will be included in that high risk list. Now you gotta remember some of it's gonna be limited by the vaccine itself. We can only go as far down as 16 um, with, the, with one vaccine, 18 with another vaccine. But we will have, you know, there are going to be certain conditions you will have to meet in order to be in that high risk category. Uh, Dr. Levine will go over that on Tuesday in terms of uh, what those uh, risk factors are once again, but you, we will have those um, uh, listed, they are listed on the health department website right now. So when, when you do open that up, it'll be that entire list. I, I was even wondering whether you would have to parse it within that list you've already described. Um, it, it, in, in terms of size of that group, you mean parse it in terms of size um, yeah. or parse it in terms of other things as well? I, 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 well, it, some, it, other, some other factor like a, a, an age banding even within that, that initial group. Yeah, I get you, Tim, on that. I, I think because it's so big, uh, 75,000, we may have to have a group A and a group B within that, within that, but they're not going to be that far apart if, when we decide to do that. They're going to be within a week of each other uh, before we open it up. And I think it's fair to say that the Johnson Johnson 11 could affect your decision going forward on that. Um, I would say stay tuned on Tuesday. I will lay it all out for you. I, I, I was anticipating that answer. Uh, Dr. Levine, I was, I was wondering, you know, the persistence of, you know, we, we're still getting uh, uh, a couple of deaths a day. And I'm wondering what the profile of those folks has been since you've done such a good job in protecting older Vermonters. Who are, who are the people that are, that are frankly still dying at this point? Yes, that's a great question. 
the majority of them have still been actually um, in the older age set. Some from the long-term care environment, some who have been in our hospitals and obviously were quite ill if that was their outcome. Um, they, they've all been in the same age distribution we think uh, that um, characterizes the larger set of deaths in Vermont. One notably was in their 50s, um, but there was significant chronic illness um, that was accounting for uh, the kind of election towards death. Um, you know, we, 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 we did look at an analysis of um, how long after someone had COVID uh, death might occur, and some of the deaths, you know, do occur quite a long time afterwards not allowing that scene to have really been uh, a factor for those individuals. Um, and I would definitely anticipate you'll see these rates come down, mainly because of the fact that less people are getting called cases in the uh, long-term care facilities and less people being hospitalized in a risk for death because of serious illness. So um, I did show a graph um, I believe it was on Tuesday uh, at the press conference or, or last week, I'm not sure now, that did demonstrate there's been a dramatic decrease in deaths overall. Admittedly, one or two a day is too much. It is tragic. But at the same time, um, when you compare it to just a week to two weeks ago, um, the curve has come down very, very nicely, and we would hope it could continue to stay that way. Tragically, we did surpass the number 200 uh, earlier this week. Uh, still probably lowest in the country, but nonetheless, uh, sad indeed. All right, thank you very much. All right, just a quick time check. It is 1220, and we're only halfway through the queue. Greg, the county courier. <laughs> Good afternoon, guys. As you probably know, uh, we've seen an instance here in Franklin County where a major outbreak has been made much worse by a, a nurse and her family who disregarded health department guidelines even after at least some of them knew that they tested positive. I'm wondering in your words, Governor, or even Dr. Levine, um, what does this mean when medical providers don't even follow the guidance from the health department? Well, I, I don't know anything about the, that uh, instance and uh, hadn't heard that, but again, uh, this is why we keep talking uh, about being vigilant and continuing to adhere to the guidance and why it's important to, to do so. Um, by and large, uh, Vermonters are doing the right thing, uh, but there is some fatigue uh, out there, uh, admittedly, and uh, people want to get back to normal, but getting back to normal uh, is in, we're not going to get there any quicker uh, by by disregarding uh, the health policies we know have a, a, a an influence on on uh, the rate of uh, transmission. So we need to until the vaccine is uh, fully available to everyone, uh, we need to continue uh, to do our job or do our duty uh, to protect others. So, uh, Dr. Levine, anything uh, you can add to that? Well, that's very well stated. I really don't have much to add to that at all. I don't have uh, great insight into the, uh, the personality or the person that uh, is being referred to. Uh, clearly, I would not want to um, overcharacterize the healthcare sector as reluctant to um, conform to what's been regarded as evidence-based and science-based public health practice. Uh, because uh, I think you'll find that this is an unfortunate exception to the rule. Um, but nonetheless, um, this, this is the time that we need to all double down because uh, we really will have a much better outcome coming out of this pandemic if we can all hang in there a little longer, not let um, politicization of things like masks or uh, personal feelings uh, interfere with what the science has told us and how it's gotten Vermont to the place it's in right now. Thank you. 
Uh, Governor, perhaps you can touch base with uh, Secretary French offline, and he can probably fill you in more on this. But I'm, I'm wondering, your administration has said time and time again that you know it's important to keep secret who's gotten this uh, virus to protect their identity. Uh, it, you know, they don't know that they're going to get it. It, it would it would uh, treat them badly. Um, but once they know they have it and and they make ill-advised decisions, such as continuing to go out in public, um, it, it brings up the question, should they be treated, you know, the same way drunk drivers are, where there are press releases and, and the public knows that they've been making unwise decisions and putting the rest of the community at risk? What's your comment on something like that? Well, again, uh, there's a difference there. One's criminal and one, we're in a pandemic. And I wouldn't say secret is the right word. I'd say confidentiality is the right term. And uh, people value uh, confidentiality. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's laws to protect uh, that as well. So we're adhering to the law. Um, we want people to do the right thing. Uh, we want people to think about others uh, as they uh, either adhere to the guidance or not, uh, and what impact that will have on others. And, and again, as I said before, if we're, we're in a race uh, to get back to normalcy, um, not adhering to the guidelines isn't going to get us there any quicker. In fact, it's going to slow down our recovery. So I'd advocate people just, you know, just buckle up here. Uh, we need to, we're in the last uh, uh, stretch of this long race, and, uh, but we can win this if we do, um, do the right things, adhere to the, to the guidance and uh, be vigilant. Uh, just, just one last uh, question on that, on that subject, Governor. You, you said that uh, you know, this isn't criminal. Um, as a lawmaker, do, do you think this should be criminal to, uh, to, to ignore guidance and, and continue to go about your daily life even, even after knowing that you or your family's tested positive? Um, that would be for uh, the legislative body to consider. But uh, from my standpoint, uh, again, we're in a, a state of emergency. We're in a pandemic. Uh, there's no playbook on this. Uh, I believe, uh, by and large, uh, people in Vermont in particular are doing the right thing. And I want to, uh, again, thank them for doing so. Uh, this is the only way we're going to get through this and get through this healthier and stronger than we went in. So. Uh, we've done a lot of things right here, and we've had a lot of compliance, and, and I would just advocate to continue on that approach, and I'm not sure that uh, making it a criminal act is going to prevent anyone from, from doing anything different, at least at this point in time. So uh, we'll get through this again, and, uh, and we'll, be, uh, we'll be better for it. And, and again, I thank Vermonters for doing the right thing. Okay, it sounds like you put support uh, uh making this criminal. But thank you, Governor, for your time, and have a great weekend. Stay safe. Colin, seven days. Uh, I have a question about the incoming school guidance. Um, local school officials have been saying the number one sticking point to bringing more middle and high school students back is distancing recommendations, which I believe currently call for six feet between students of this age. Does the administration plan to change these recommendations? to achieve its goal of resuming in-person classes? And if so, how do you plan on convincing teachers and staff that this is safe given existing CDC guidelines? It's very French. Yeah, it's, it's certainly uh, something we have on our radar, but again, um, it is definitely our goal uh, to bring it back more in person, but it's also part of the reason we've achieved or focused on that goal. Uh, as you heard today, there's compelling risks involved uh, for students if we don't do that. But that doesn't mean we're ever gonna sacrifice the safety of our schools. Uh, we, we made a consistent point, I think, that we expect conditions to improve. And as I mentioned, 30% uh, of our schools are operating in person now in these conditions. 50% uh, of those are elementary schools. Um, we expect conditions to improve, particularly with the advent of vaccine. So we will definitely uh, modify our guidance accordingly, but it will be in conjunction with an assessment of the safety of the conditions. Thanks, Secretary Sorry, could you just maybe clarify the guidance coming out today just from the recovery process? 
Right. Uh, yeah, the, I think you're referring to our safe and healthy schools guidance, which is the broader guidance that uh, speaks to the operation of schools. The guidance that we're putting out this afternoon is about uh, f sort of framing out and outlining the recovery process. The two aren't necessarily the same issue. Sure. Okay. And but could you just say, kind of frankly, um, do you anticipate a change to the distancing recommendations within the next couple of months? Uh, if conditions improve, I definitely would think our uh, guidance would adapt accordingly. Um, I also would just point out, you mentioned the CDC guidance. The CDC guidance is advisory uh, in that regard. Uh, to the, it says something like six feet to the ex max, you know, the extent possible or something like that. Uh, so we definitely, um, you know, we take that information uh, as we have all along. Uh, we think the CDC guidance is extremely helpful, but we evaluate it for ourselves and definitely look internationally what's going on. Uh, many countries in the world are operating at one meter or around three feet. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely look at our guidance as a function of uh, the conditions. And we, once again, we expect the conditions to improve here in the coming weeks. And then just one question about the survey. I've seen some teachers, uh, and I think you alluded to this, um, note that some schools are currently on vacation. And um, it sounds like there's going to be a, a rush of responses coming on Monday. but. Um, can you just reiterate the purpose of this survey? It's not like these people are signing up to get, a, get in line for a vaccine. Um, it's more to gauge the interest rate. Right? I mean, what, what uh, possible side effect could happen if um, not enough teachers sign up? Yeah, it's, thank you for bringing that up. This is not about signing up for the vaccine. It's really to inform our planning process. And once again, we haven't settled on what the next phase of our plan will be. Uh, but as we've seen, I think the governor alluded to nationally, uh, we need to understand to what, you know, what is that basically that percent of interest in accepting a vaccine? Um, it might sound obvious that everyone wants a vaccine, but uh, we've seen different uptake percentages around the country. So this, this survey was set up very quickly uh, as a result of new supply information. Um, I'm very pleased, very, very pleased actually, the response we've seen so far. Uh, but we do acknowledge uh, it is vacation for some districts, but uh, we have the cooperation of school districts to get that message out in social media and so forth. So I'm confident uh, by the end of the day, Monday, we'll have a good, good understanding of what, what people's interest is. But it's not about signing up for the vaccine. It's just getting a sense of their interest. Thanks. Thank you. Avery, WHO I was wondering if we could get some more information about what this outside of the school year programming would look like, such as who's running it and who would be paying for it. Secretary French. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, school districts, it, it's something they typically always run, but I would expect summer programming this year to probably look a little different. Again, I think it's really important that uh, districts uh, do that assessment of their conditions before we decide on what the solutions will be. Uh, but the issue of funding is an important one, um, and I, I mentioned briefly, but uh, we're seeing considerable federal resources now come into the state uh, for education, um, and potentially we'll see additional funding uh, under the new appropriation from Congress. So at this moment, I feel pretty, very confident that uh, the additional funding from the federal government will be sufficient to support our recovery efforts. Uh, but the first step is to understand what the needs are, and then the second step will be to devise the strategies, and I'm sure summer will be part of that strategy. And obviously this has been a pretty stressful time for students and staff. Do you think they'll, they'll need a really true summer break, just kind of a break from anything school-related? No, absolutely. Uh, it's one of the things uh, in our guidance we sort of acknowledge that. It is, um, as we, we point the system to doing this planning and focused work uh, this spring, I think there will be um, an interest probably uh, just out of their concern for students to try to basically remediate for the entire pandemic experience in the six weeks that we have left in the school year. And that's, that's probably going to put way too much stress on the system and it's not advisable from an educational standpoint. So we do, uh, we do want to acknowledge that you know, the time we have this unique opportunity as a state with our conditions being very positive and our, our strong experience on how to manage things that we have, we have an opportunity and also responsibility I think to uh, do more right now. Uh, but we have to do that in a very thoughtful way. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity for us to, to articulate that out in a, in a thoughtful way that won't have a negative impact on the kids. Um, but it's, I think, yeah, I feel a sense of responsibility for the system to try to move forward in this area now. Thank you. Howard, VPR. Governors. 
The uh, 10 names finalists for the uh, Cannabis Control Board have been turned over to your office. Um, I'm wondering if you can remind us of how you're prioritizing the tax and regulate system and when you might uh, think and expect to give those uh, three names over to the Senate for final confirmation. Yeah, we're working our way through the process. We want to make sure that we have all the names uh, of those uh, who are qualified, and uh, then we'll make our decision. We'll be taking, uh, we'll be interviewing in the uh, the coming weeks. So um, stay tuned on that. So you don't know if it's going to be months or weeks or when you're going to if the Senate's going to get it this session or anything. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm sure we'll get uh, the names of the Senate during the session. Yes. Okay, and one uh, question for Dr. Levine. We got an email from someone. If someone owns a second home in, say, Massachusetts, and they drive from Vermont right to their home in Massachusetts, just enter their home, do their stuff there, and return to Vermont, do they need to quarantine upon return? Not if they're vaccinated. <laughs> uh, but if they're unvaccinated, I believe the same um, travel guidance pertains as did before. Okay. Supposedly they were told differently, but thanks for clarifying that. I'm all set. Thank you. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Thank you. With the entry of Walgreens offering vaccination through this federal program, it seems that could be confusing to some Vermonters. What is your guidance? The Vermonters in choosing between Walgreens and, and the Vermont Health Department. Well, again, I just wanted to the, the addition of Walgreens was because they had some supply, um, and we wanted to offer this as an enhancement of the program that we have, uh, which is um, quite expansive in some respects. We'll get through uh, this next band, uh, 65 and older, probably in a matter of. Uh, Two, two weeks um, and we'll be finished with with the addition of Walgreens. So it's just an enhancement. So don't don't get discouraged if you can't get your uh, your uh, vaccination through Walgreens. Uh, it was a limited supply, but we wanted to get that out there as quick as possible. But you'll, uh, as Secretary Smith had said before, you'll be able to sign up on Monday uh, or Tuesday or whenever next week after 8:15 uh, on Monday. And, uh, and we'll get you vaccinated within a short period of time. Are you receiving uh, any information from the federal government or Walgreens if they uh, receive another supply and want to make this offer again? They, they will uh, continue, and Alice should let Secretary Smith answer this, but uh, they have this ongoing uh, relationship with the federal government, so their supply is, uh, is they're resupplied every week. So I would expect uh, with our pharmacy program, uh, other pharmacies as well, not just Walgreen, um, but, um, but other uh, pharmacies will continue as well as the FQHCs in some uh, instances will be receiving their supplies on a weekly basis, just like we are, but at a much reduced level. Uh, Secretary Smith. Yes, thank you, Governor. The pharmacy program, both at the federal level and whatever we can allocate at the state level, for example, we're going to have a thousand a dose pop up in Washington County that's going to be run through Kinney's. So the pharmacy program, both at the federal level and what we do at the state level, is going to be an important component of uh, the vaccination strategy. What we want to make sure is that it, it stays coordinated with anything that we're doing and Kinney's has been Kinney's has been is fairly integrated into our system Walgreens um, we're trying to get more integrated into our system uh, even though the allocation comes from the feds we know what that allocation is um, when when they when it arrives at Walgreens and therefore we can help to sort of coordinate that as we move on these pharmacy programs are going to be essential in terms of how we look at uh, our vaccination strategy moving forward. Thank you. One last question. Uh, is Walgreens and Kinney's and any of these other federal programs through these pharmacies, 
Are they required to stay within your time timeline and plan for Vermont eligibility to get vaccinated? Yes, they are. And by the way, Kinney's is under our state program. Walgreens is under the federal program. Thank you. Secretary French, um, many of the questions in the teacher survey about vaccination interest asks about underlying health conditions. And what are you hoping to learn from those responses? Is it how many teachers will have been covered by previous vaccination efforts or an idea of how many teachers could return to in-person instruction if they received their vaccine or, or what are those reasons? Yeah, it was your original question. Uh, you know, the health department would like to see that information disaggregated to understand to what extent folks might be covered under uh, the other uh, part of our strategy. Okay, gotcha. And then also teachers are questioning why the survey was sent out this week when half of them were on break. Can you explain that timing? Yeah, again, it was really precipitated based on new supply information that we had coming into the state. Uh, we were fully aware that half of the districts were on vacation, uh, but we also had confidence that uh, districts would put the word out. And again, uh, we are seeing a strong response. So uh, it, is, it is a pandemic and uh, we have to move forward very quickly on this, this opportunity to potentially vaccinate school staff. So I appreciate your flexibility. Gotcha. But my last question was, and when you mentioned the recovery plan, you said there were three focus areas in the assessment phase. Can you share what those three focus areas are? Yeah, so we have three focus areas that will transcend the entire uh, recovery area, and they're uh, large. Uh, but one is the um, sort of well-being of students, which would include mental health and the social-emotional well-being. Uh, that's one domain. <clears throat> A second is uh, the engagement domain, which I think is, is really important. Um, as we heard, you know, particularly with the teenagers, uh, a lot of the social activities related to school are probably equally important right now to uh, some of the other more traditional aspects. So that, that piece of engagement, uh, which is also where we get at some of the truancy issues and attendance issues. And then the third domain is academics, the core, the core of it. But the point you know, I'll make with uh, those domains is we see them as sort of all being equal. Uh, we want schools to focus on all three of those. Uh, we think a balance on all three will be critical uh, in our success and recovery. Great, thank you so much. Yes, my question is about this year's graduating class, high school seniors. Are they prepared for or will they be prepared for their next phase in life? Uh, and if not, what can be done for them? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would think so. I think the, you know, it's important to remember that this has uh, been a one slice of their entire academic career. And I know schools have been really focused on ensuring uh, the seniors are able to move on to their next uh, plans. But, you know, again, this, this uh, pandemic's been disruptive for all students, not just seniors, and certainly uh, for all seniors around the country. So it is a challenging moment for them, and uh, my heart goes out to their situation. But I, I was going to make the point earlier, too. I think um, one of the questions I received was about how the year would end. And I think it is important that we acknowledge uh, that the year should end on a celebratory note. And, um, I think if we can get back to in person and really start to focus on uh, developing those plans for recovery, but we should we should endeavor to end the, the year on a celebratory note because it's uh, it's been a tough year for everyone and um, it'll be great to see everyone back at school and uh, those normal routines such as proms. I had an email the other day from a parent asking me about proms already, uh, proms, graduations, all those things that we normally uh, see at the end of the school year. It'd be great to see those back up and running. Okay, thank you. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'm asking today about the coronavirus and what counts what accounts for immunity. Specifically, if you get the virus, if you've been confirmed to have it and recovered from it, will that count as immunity for purposes of travel, visiting households, and so forth? Um, if not, why why not? Um, I guess Commissioner Levine, um, maybe you could answer that one. 
So there is a degree of natural immunity that people will have if they've had coronavirus, uh, has an, has COVID-19 as an illness. The question would be uh, the durability of that immunity and, um, you know, will it go beyond several months and persist longer into the future? Um, the recommendations currently are for anyone who has had COVID-19 to still get vaccinated uh, because we want to augment that immunity as much as possible. And there's some very important data that just came out regarding uh, from, from UK that shows that with the Pfizer vaccine, at least, people who've had prior coronavirus illness can probably suffice to have just one of the two-shot regimen and not require the second shot because their immunity is boosted to such a high degree after the first. Now, this is only in the UK right now, and it's early data, um, and it's in front of the CDC, but it's not active in this country at this point in time. But uh, you'll, you'll hear debates about that in the ensuing week. Okay. Uh, can you share data that um, are studies that show that vaccinated people are safe to do all these things? What are the studies on that that you can share? Well, the guidance currently uh, is, again, uh, and we use this, is within the 90-day period, we believe uh, people are fine in terms of interacting, not having to quarantine if they come in contact with another case, et cetera. We're not uh -huh. certain yet beyond the 90 days uh, after the natural infection uh, if that will persist. So uh, we're going with national guidance on that one for this point in time. I think, Dr. Levine, I think, okay. I think he was talking about the vaccine, the efficacy of the vaccine and durability of the vaccine. Again, we're just going oh. by uh, CDC guidelines at this point. Uh -huh. But... Um, be behind those CDC guidelines, can the Vermont public see the studies that they're using to, to write those guidelines, or, or does that have, we have to go to CDC for that? Uh, all the references are available on the CDC website. Okay. All right. Thanks for look. Okay. Thank you. Chris, um, Chris Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. I'd like to circle back to the uh, situation at the uh, correctional facility here in Newport. And I understand that there is a lockdown, but I'm wondering exactly what that means. And what about the staff who works there? Are they also in lockdown, and what's to prevent them from going out in the community and potentially uh, spreading uh, COVID outside, um, on the outside? Secretary Smith. I'll take that, Governor, if you if you um, if you wish. The right now we only have one staff member in that facility who has tested positive. As you know, Chris, we test those facilities quite often, and once we do have a positive in those facilities, we test them uh, rigorously uh, in that facility. So we know who has COVID at this point. Um, we know that it's one staff person and 21 incarcerated individuals. Uh, we'll continue to look at, um, we'll continue to test to make sure that we have a handle on that. In, in terms of lockdown, I'll refer you to um, uh, uh, corrections in terms specifically what that means, because it does have a, there's a, there's a specific term of what that means, and I'll have them get in touch with you, Chris, about what that means. Okay, thank you. And uh, just a quick follow-up. How does something like this happen anyway if everybody there is supposed to be wear wearing masks and practicing social distancing? Yeah, Chris, that's a great question, and, and sort of the contact tracing will help us to determine that. But in the past, what we've determined that the facilities are have been maintained to be pretty safe. What where is introduced is coming in uh, to that facility from the outside. We're just going to have to figure that out through contact tracing. And if an inmate refuses to wear a mask, can can what's the uh, punishment for that? Do you put him in isolate? Put him or her in isolation or? I, I I will have to refer you to corrections, and you can ask them that when they call you. How's that? 
Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I had a couple of follow-up questions on the prison outbreak as well, um, and I'd be happy to take a call for corrections too. But I'm curious, uh, maybe you know off the top, uh, is this uh, the largest outbreak in a Vermont prison since the one, uh, the early one in Swanton? Yeah, I I hesitate because I just can't remember, but it, it, it's one of our, we've had three large outbreaks. Uh, we've had the one in Swanton, we've had the one in Mississippi, and I think it's this one as well. Um, in state, it may be the second, at 21, it may be the second, the second largest, but I, I, I don't know the, the correct answer. Let me get corrections to get back to you on that. And do you know, um, uh, in the uh, early on, uh, there was uh, the establishment of a special um, uh, arrangement at the St. Johnsbury Prison for transfers. I feel like that operational standpoint has been phased out long ago. Is, is the intent to keep everyone at, at uh, Newport? Um, or is there still some aspect of moving positive inmates around? No, the, the, right now, the aspect, you know, we had that facility because we didn't know in the beginning uh, what sort of capabilities we had and what capabilities we would need in terms of an outbreak. Because, as you know, back in March and April and, and May of 2020, we didn't know a lot of things um, in terms of, of, uh, of this pandemic. We've gotten a lot better uh, and we believe we can keep these um, these individuals where they are um, in the facility, isolated, um, especially with our low um, uh, inmate count uh, throughout the system. And uh, do you know uh, with 22 uh, cases, I guess, up there, are, are those cases also reflected on the health department dashboard? I see... Um, They've had about 24 cases in the last 10 days up in Orleans County. Is it safe to assume that the 22 prison cases are the vast majority of, of those on the health dashboard? Yeah, I don't know that, but I'll get back to you on that. Okay. And then, uh, if I may, uh, one quick follow-up for Secretary French. Uh, you alluded just a, a few moments ago the hope that uh, the school year might be able to end on a positive note. Are, are you dangling the possibility that there might be proms and graduation ceremonies of some form this year? Uh, Andrew, before uh, he answers that question, I just want to assure you that we do um, account for those positives at the uh, correctional facility. They will be on the dashboard. The question, I think Mike was trying to determine whether they already have been or they will be, but they, they are accounted for. I see. Okay. No, thanks. I was uh, expressing my hope that uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, I've had several questions from superintendents and principals about um, end of year celebrations. Uh, I basically told them just to stand by on that. Um, we need to, we have some important decisions in front of us relative to vaccination and getting the recovery process oriented. Um, we also don't really have an understanding of what the conditions will be like in June. Um, but I, I expect somewhere around April 1, we'll start to contemplate those end of year uh, situations. Okay, thank you. Ethan, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, more, uh, well, sorry, good afternoon, I guess. Um, I guess my question goes towards uh, Secretary Smith. I was wondering if you could refresh our memory on what the plan is for the motel hotel voucher program geared towards houseless individuals and families and sort of like how the program itself will sort of transition or shift as we move into the summer and the fall. Thank you for the question. Right now, um, we have a, approximately 2,600 people um, uh, housed in hotel motels. That has uh, been consistent since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we spend about $75 million a year. Most of it is reimbursed by the federal government right now. That won't continue forever. Um, so our plan is to transition to a plan that we've been talking about for a couple of years now, and that is to transition to a plan that um, provides the funding to, to lo local areas to um, to 
bring the shelter and we won't eliminate the hotel motel program, but to bring it down to a more local level where it can be managed um, at a local level more efficiently and more effectively. That has not changed. Um, we're just making sure that the timing aspect of it, um, it is past the pandemic. So right now we're looking at October as the date we would um, start to transition that program um, to a more manageable and sustainable program uh, and go back to where we originally were two years ago in moving that program to a, a more localized program where needs can be assessed, where there isn't all these regulations um, that have to be sort of applied at the state level that don't really fit the needs of, of, um, of various communities, that there's more flexibility in the program. And I think you'll start seeing that, um, that implemented uh, as soon as we have a good idea of uh, when we're going to be coming out of this uh, pandemic. And I suspect, you know, by the fall, we'll, we'll be well beyond um, coming out of this. So to that point, um, just yesterday in Washington County, there was a public forum organized by some homeless guests at the Hilltop and in Berlin. And there's a lot of testimonials raised by guests both describing like the strengths and weaknesses of um, navigating uh, the ends system and working with the program. And, and, you know, I know we've heard in the past some concerns around physical safety that have gone on and that was touched upon. Um, but uh, some guests also brought up just like, uh, the challenges around navigating resources and support from service providers and especially trying to find what is available in terms of the permanent housing in and around the area. So I guess I was just curious, based off of that, um, how, does, how do you envision um, these local service providers being able to manage the transition out of the program when it appears that there have already been challenges in terms of trying to meet everybody's um, individual needs, especially as more people have been... Um, brought through um, the hotel and motel system? Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to work through those issues um, with uh, local communities as we move forward. Obviously, the hotel motel system has provided a lot of challenges as well. Um, it's not an ideal situation. We need to move people to permanent housing. That's number one. And we can do that at the local level, I think, um, very in a, in a more flexible manner. Secondly, we've got to make we've got to eliminate sort of the 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 red tape that's involved in in making sure that we address the needs of the homeless, which I think we can do at the community level. But right now, you know, the hotel motel program has its challenges too. Even though we are protecting people from COVID. It does have its challenges. Um, we are uh, housing and feeding, you know, like I said, 2,600 2, people. But, you know, there are security issues that we have to deal with. There are mental health issues that we have to deal with. There are substance abuse issues that we have to deal with. So the program itself needs to be fundamentally changed once we come out of the pandemic to meet all those needs. And I think we can do it the way that we're looking at it um, at the community level um, uh, as we move forward and come out of this pandemic. Okay, and my uh, last question is like, do you have a, an estimate towards the, um, I know things are still in the works about the transition come, like you said, October, but do you have an estimate of how, what the reduction to the program would be in terms of how much vouchers would be distributed towards those uh, 2,600 guests? Yeah, I, I don't have that breakdown in terms of, um, you know, what we've done during the pandemic is loosen up eligibility um, quite substantially. Um, I think we'll probably go back to eligibility standards at some point um, in terms of what who qualifies for the program. Right now, um, it is, uh, you know, during the pandemic, we've been a fairly... Um, uh, less restrictive in our in, in our uh, in our regulations dealing on who's qualified for the programs. Do I think that there will be more uh, 
qualifications that will be applied to the program as we move out of the pandemic? The answer is yes. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you again on Tuesday.